Hi everyone and welcome back to Green Drone Arizona. This is Module 2 Lesson 1 UAV Technology. My name is Jacob Draper and I am also a project manager at uh, NAU and for the Green Drone Arizona program. I'm the UAV pilot for uh, this program as well and so I'm excited to share my little bit of knowledge about UAVs and uh, drones with all of you guys. So here we go. Well, I guess the bigger question is, what is a UAV? I know I mentioned that in my intro, but I didn't actually go over it. So why don't we just uh, take a second and think about what a UAV is? So in helping to help you understand what a UAV is, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures in these next couple slides. And I want you guys to think about whether or not each of these images depicts a UAV or if it doesn't. So here's the first one. Is this a UAV? How about this picture? Is this a UAV? And last but not least, is this a UAV? And before answering that question, I want you to know that individuals are able to actually sit inside of the cockpit on this aircraft. So in short, if we go back to those three images of the different aircrafts, the first two are UAVs and the last one is not a UAV. And why is it not a UAV? Well, a UAV stands for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. And like I said in that third picture, that uh, we were going to assume that individuals could sit inside of the cockpit on that aircraft. Therefore, it is not considered a UAV. UAVs are also considered drones or UAS, that is unmanned aerial systems. So as far as drones go, we have several different types of drones. We have multi-copters, which come in quadcopters, hexacopters, octocopters. Um, I've even seen some that have five props now. Uh, we have other aircraft that we call fixed wings. You can think of those as airplanes. Uh, they do require a individual or the pilot to actually throw the aircraft to get it into flight. And we also have hybrids. And we also sometimes call these VTOLs. Uh, that's a vertical takeoff and landing. And so I kind of think of these like the military uh, aircraft and Osprey, where they're able to uh, take off like a helicopter. And then those props tip over and they fly just like a plane. So in a UAV, again, it's unmanned, so there's no pilot on board. Uh, it can be remote controlled, or it can be programmed to fly autonomous flights. And according to FAA Part 107, which is the commercial license, uh, your drone upon takeoff has to weigh less than 55 pounds. Um, and there is a minimum weight limit as well, but for our sake, we're mostly concerned with that 55 pounds at takeoff. So in the last slide, I briefly introduced what the three different types of UAVs are. Uh, in the next slide, I want to dive a little bit deeper into each of those types of UAVs, talk about the pros and cons, and why you would and would not want to use them for specific projects. So here on the left, we have a multi-copter. This is actually a quadcopter, and this is our DJI uh, Phantom 4 Multispectral. It's the same platform as the Phantom 4 Pro. It just has a different sensor or camera on the bottom that allows us to capture multispectral imagery. Multispectral uh, just refers to different bands of light, and we'll cover that later down the road. So some of the pros of these quadcopters is they're very versatile. Uh, they're very user-friendly and they're pretty much relatively inexpensive compared to other platforms uh, in the drone world. The huge con is battery life, and it's one that we're always struggling with on the Lower Salt River Restoration Project uh, and in Green Drone. Um, you know, you're really looking at about 20 to 30 minutes of flight time, um, and depending on the size of your project, that's really not enough time to, to capture all the imagery that you need. So, Quadcopters are great for smaller projects uh, and also for indoors. In the middle here, we have an EB, which is a fixed wing. Some of the pros of fixed wings, they have very long flight time. They're great for large projects, and it decreases the amount of time that we're out on the project site collecting imagery. 
Some of the cons, the huge one, in my opinion, uh, is having to actually throw the aircraft to get it into flight can be quite daunting and scary for, for new pilots when they're having to launch their fixed wing. Uh, the other one is landing. So, you know, you, you throw this thing and you get it up into flight. Well, when you go to land it, you're just landing it right on the ground. And the sensor or the camera is, is on the bottom of this, uh, this platform. And so when you land it, you can damage your camera. You can break off the nose of the aircraft. You can break off the wing of an aircraft especially if you're having winds and other obstacles while you're out uh, on your project. Some of the other cons, they are expensive and they cannot be used indoors. Here on the right, we have our hybrid or our VTOL. This is a Wingtra. This is a very popular uh, VTOL or hybrid platform. Uh, some of the pros of these, very long flight time. Uh, some of them, they can fly longer than fixed wings. They decrease your survey time, obviously, and they're great for large and small projects because they're able to take off vertically, land vertically, uh, and then they fly like a plane. So the cons of something like this Wingtra, it's very expensive. They are very expensive platforms and they cannot be used indoors. I am certainly no expert when it comes to the mechanics of flight. However, there are people out there that are very knowledgeable. So the next slide kind of talks about the, uh, the physics of flight, the mechanics of flight with a quadcopter. Uh, it is a very short video. I strongly encourage you all to check it out. Kind of talks about how this quadcopter is able to stay aloft or in the air without actually moving in a specific direction and how the rotors uh, change speeds to perform different movements. So very interesting and I strongly encourage everyone to check it out. So after reviewing that video, I'd like to ask everybody, what factors do you think can change the physics of flight? And maybe one of them that you might be thinking of is wind. Maybe another one is the weight of the object that you're carrying on the aircraft. Maybe one is temperature. But what else do you think might affect how that aircraft moves in the air? So in addition to some of those factors that you may have said aloud on the last slide, there's one of these concepts called density altitude. And it's something that we're exposed to uh, as drone pilots when we're studying for a part 107 exam. And I know this was particularly hard for me to understand. One, because I'm, I'm well, I guess the main reason is because I'm not a pilot by trade. Uh, so what is density altitude? Well, density altitude is essentially how dense is the air and the factors that affect uh, the denseness of the air. So air density is affected by changes in altitude. It is affected by changes in temperature and humidity. And so as your density altitude is increasing, your aircraft performance is decreasing. Why is that? Well, as temperature increases, your air is expanding and there's uh, if we're thinking of a propeller on a helicopter, there's less bite uh, that that blade has to grab onto the air. And it's the same thing for airplanes. If you look at this picture here, the top one is showing a cold, dry day at sea level. And so we can see it has a low density altitude and the airplane is able to take off at a shorter distance on the runway. If you look at the bottom picture, it's a hot, humid day at 5,000 feet. So we've also gone up in altitude and the uh, density altitude is increased. And in this case, the aircraft did not, uh, or the pilot, they did not compensate for the density altitude. And so it ran out of room on the runway before it was able to get up to speed to take off. So this is an, uh, a very important concept to understand uh, because it really determines how your aircraft is going to operate at various conditions. So enough of all that complicated stuff. Who wants to fly drones? Well, perhaps maybe before we can say yes or no to that, we should decide, are we going to fly recreationally or are we going to fly commercially? So a recreational user, as defined by the FAA, means that you are flying your drone as a recreational user when you are flying for fun. 
That is it. You cannot go out with the intent of collecting images to sell. You cannot be hired by somebody to go out and capture video or pictures. It is strictly for fun and for personal use. There's no knowledge test required yet. That's kind of an ongoing thing where they're trying to figure out what a recreational test will look like, what information recreational users should know. So I'm constantly checking periodically just to kind of see what's going on with that. But as of yet, there is no test required. So how do we fly commercially? We know we don't need to take a test for a recreational user, but is there a test for a commercial user? Uh, is it just a is it just a written test or do we have to actually do a field test? How do we become a commercial drone pilot? So a commercial user is determined a commercial user when you are either operating while being paid, meaning your company sends you out on a, a job to fly your drone to collect imagery or video, or you're operating your drone with the intent of selling the images or video that you've collected. As of right now, there is a knowledge test that is required to obtain your license. You must be 16 years of age at the time of the exam, and there's a ton of study material available through the FAA. Uh, I would also strongly encourage taking an online study course. They're typically just a couple hundred bucks, but they set you up really, really nicely for that exam. So after passing your exam, you receive a license that uh, looks exactly like that bottom picture there on the left. It's essentially like a driver's license card. You gotta have it with you while you're operating your drone. Once you get that, you register your drone just like you would with uh, a recreational user, and then you're ready to go. Well, we've gone through the trouble of obtaining our FAA Part 107 license. We are now ready to commercially operate. Does that mean that we can just go out and fly or should we have to prepare for our flights? What do you guys think? So the fact of the matter is you always have to prepare for your flights or your missions, even if you have a commercial license. I found this image here on the internet. Um, these are all steps that I complete when I'm getting ready doing my pre-flight uh, checklist. Um, you certainly don't have to do these in order. Uh, but I'm going to start at the left and I'm going to move to the right and go through each of these categories so that you know what you're looking for to ensure that you have a safe flight. So the first concept I want to cover here is checking our airspace. And what a mess that looks like. Am I right? I mean, goodness gracious, that is a mess of a map. Well, it's not too bad. We just need to get a little bit more information so that we understand exactly what this map is telling us. If we start by looking at the center of this map, when we kind of go up and to the left a little bit, we'll see what looks to be like an airport. We see it says Pittsburgh INTL. Now what this is telling us is that's Pittsburgh International Airport. We see that the airport falls within a solid blue circle. What these shelves or these rings uh, tell us is that controlled airspace uh, starts at different altitudes and sometimes also ends at different altitudes. And so if we go to this outside blue circle here, that is telling us that that is still the same class or the same type of airspace. It's just telling us that controlled airspace starts at a different height. And so if we go back to Pittsburgh International Airport, if we look down and to the right just a smidge, we'll see that we see an 80 over SFC. What that is telling us is that controlled airspace starts at the surface and goes up to 8,000 feet. As we move out into that next ring or tier, um, just a, a little heads up, we like to think of uh, airspace as like a wedding cake or a tiered cake that's flipped upside down. And that's kind of how airspace looks um, if you look at it like a cross section on a map. So this outside ring here, we see that if we go up and to the right just a little bit, we see 80 over 25. This is telling us that controlled airspace starts at 2,500 feet and goes to 8,000 feet. 
Now, there's a lot of stuff that's on this map. I don't want to go too heavily into it, but I am going to point out one other thing just to give you a little bit more information. If we go down from Pittsburgh International Airport, we're going to see a little triangle with a dot in the center. Next to that dot on the right, we see 1517, and below that, we see 263. What this is telling us is that this is a tower, first of all, and it's saying that the altitude or the height of this tower is 1,517 feet MSL. That's mean sea level. And so you might be thinking, well, is the tower really 1,517 feet tall? No. If we go down to where in parentheses we see 263, that is 263 feet AGL, that's above ground level. So the tower itself is 263 feet, and if we were to subtract that from the 1517 above, that would be the elevation of where the base of the tower is, and then it goes up 263 feet, or up to 1517 feet MSL. All right, so continuing checking our airspace. Well, joke's on us, guys, because there are several individuals out there who came up with applications that we can use from our mobile devices to see where controlled airspace starts without having to look at those super complicated aeronautical charts. And so a few of these apps are AirMap, Before You Fly, Kitty Hawk, etc. There's, there's all kinds of different apps that you can use out there. All of them do the same thing, and they're all much easier to understand than looking at those charts. And so I drew an arrow here on this map on the right, and it looks like it's pointing to this golf course. So we're going to imagine that we're flying this golf course. That's our job. We want to fly at 80 feet above ground level, and I want to know, will we be entering controlled airspace flying at 80 feet above ground level. Well, if we look at the map, we can see that the golf course falls within this, uh, this rectangle. It's kind of highlighted in that faint blue. And if we look towards the bottom right-hand corner, we can see that there is a 100 with an orangish yellow bar above that 100. And what this is telling us is that controlled airspace starts at 100 feet. This means that if we wanted to uh, continue with our goal of flying this golf course at 80 feet above ground level, we would not be within controlled airspace. That doesn't mean that we should just ignore uh, the fact that the airport is next next door, you know, there's always steps that we can take to ensure that they are aware that we are performing a flight here. But the most important thing is that flying at 80 feet is avoiding uh, being within that controlled airspace. So like everything in life, there's always restrictions, and that's the case with airspace as well. Um, one of the big ones is military property. On the left here is a screenshot that I took. This is down by Yuma, Arizona. This is the Barry M. Goldwater Air Force Range. Why can't we just go down and fly over military property? Well, we're not sure what kind of aircraft is flying over this property. We're not sure what the daily activities are. There could be uh, rounds being shot off. There could be tests going on. There could be all sorts of aircraft flying around. So this is not, this is not an area that we can just go down and start flying sporting events. Let's say uh, the Diamondbacks are playing at Chase Field and you don't have seats but you want to get a cool picture of the stadium full and everybody out on the field. Why can't we do that? Well one of the big ones you might be thinking of is what happens if I lose connection of my drone and this falls and hits somebody? It could seriously injure somebody. Wilderness areas are another one that we cannot fly drones in. This is designated by Congress and stated that we cannot operate motorized vehicle vehicles uh, within a wilderness area. This does apply to drones as well. Uh, the last thing I would want if I'm out in the wilderness trying to have some peace and quiet is to have a drone ripping by me because someone wants to take pictures or get video. Another big one that you might uh, maybe hits a little bit closer to home for some of you is wildfires. Uh, wildfires seem to be kind of a common thing down here in the, the lower lower areas of the desert these days. Um, Justin and I, we, we worked for Tano National Forest and we 
definitely spend some time on wildfires. And what happens is people want to get some, some super awesome pictures. I agree, they are super awesome of the fire. Uh, but what happens is whenever a, a drone is detected in the air around the wildfire, they have to put all aircraft on the ground. And this is terrible because if it's someone's house that's about to be engulfed with flames, they can't have the aircraft there to drop water or retardant. And so it's just not worth putting your drone up and having everybody's well-being at risk. So what are some other examples that you can think of that might cause airspace restrictions? Maybe for some of you that are getting close to 18 uh, and you can vote, maybe elected officials. So that's another one. When the president comes into town, there will be a restriction that's put into place that does not allow you to operate your drone while an elected official is in town. So let's get away from airspace a little bit and let's talk about weather. This right here on the left is called a TAF or a terminal aerodrome forecast. This is the most accurate forecast that's available at larger airports and they have a radius of five miles. So this is a, an accurate uh, weather forecast uh, within five miles any direction of that airport. Now, you don't have to check these when you're going to perform your drone flight. You can obviously check the weather forecast to see if the weather conditions are suitable for the aircraft that you're using. Uh, but again, these are the most accurate within a certain radius of these airports. And so I'm gonna go through the top line of this picture just so you kind of can see how this reads. Uh, KMEM is likely Memphis Airport. Um, this report was created on the 12th day of the month at 1720 Zulu time. This report is good for the 12th day starting at 1800 to the 13th day at 2400. We have wind at 200 degrees, that's the direction, at 12 knots. Visibility is five statute miles. There's haze that's broken at 3000 feet. There's a probability of 40% chance at 2022 that visibility will be one statute mile with thunderstorm, thunderstorms with rain, and we have overcast at 800 feet. So that's kind of how you read that. Um, it's very confusing. I would much rather just check the Weather Channel or any other weather app and see, okay, is the temperature uh, acceptable for the equipment that I'm using, and is the wind okay, and is there any rain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, so we've completed our flying conditions and we've checked that off. So now we're going to move on to the required documentation needed to perform our flight. All right, so documentation and operating laws. Sometimes you are required to have an FAA certificate of authorization if it's required. That's down here on the picture on the bottom left. Um, this is actually a certificate uh, of waiver or authorization that we completed uh, for the Lower Salt River Restoration Project. You always need your city and county documentation if that's required. Aircraft registration, that's the top image here on the left. That is actually the, this is the real registration that we have for our Phantom 4 multispectral. You need your pilot license, which again looks like that driver's license card. Uh, and then that's pretty much it. I mean, you may be required to have more documentation. The more, the better. Uh, the big one that we use, or the big ones that we use for Green Drone and the Lower Salt River Restoration Project is always the pilot license and aircraft registration. We don't deal a whole lot with city and county documentation, uh, but again, just make sure that you're checking where you live, see what your county and your city requires, because that's going to differ from city to city and from county to county. All right, that was kind of a twofer right there. Uh, so we've completed our flying conditions. We have our required documentation, and we also have the local drone operation laws, which is, falls more into that county and city uh, type documentation that's required. So now let's move on to the physical state of the drone. 
All right, checking our equipment. This is arguably one of the most important things you can do before going out to actually put your drone up into the air. So we wanna make sure we do a thorough job whenever we're inspecting our equipment. Starting with the aircraft body, we wanna make sure that there's no physical damage on the actual aircraft body. Moving on to the payload, the gimbal, and the camera. Again, the gimbal is what houses the sensor or the camera. And so we want to make sure that the gimbal moves freely and there's no smudges on the actual camera. You know, once you get the drone up in the air and you collect images and then realize that there were smudges on your camera, it's already too late. So we want to make sure that that's cleaned and ready to go. Batteries, we want to make sure that they're not leaking or that there's some weird temperature. Sometimes these batteries go bad and they get very hot. That's not something that we want to be putting into the drone and also into the air. The rotors are the silver cylindrical looking objects on top of the aircraft body on this Phantom 4. We want to make sure that there's no physical damage, no corrosion, and that they move freely. The propellers, we want to make sure that the propellers are not chipped or cracked in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we don't want to risk putting anything onto the drone that may end up causing a failure or an accident while we're in the air. Moving on to the remote controller, we want to make sure that the control sticks are secured onto the controller, the antennas work just fine, and everything is sound and ready to go. I also want to mention that it is inevitable that you are going to hit bugs while you are up in the air, and so it's important that before you fly at the beginning of the day, between batteries, or at the end of the day, that you clean your propellers off just to get rid of that extra resistance that's going to build up on the propellers. So understanding the controller, this is this is definitely a, a better training to do in person or if you're out in an open field and you have the ability to kind of play around. Um, but essentially the left control stick is what gets you to go up and down and turn the actual aircraft. Uh, the right control stick is what allows us to go forwards, backwards, side to side. We have our antennas. We have the device clamp, which you can put your phone in. You can use an iPad or any sort of tablet. We have a return to home button. So if we press that, that means that our drone will come back to where it took off from. And our status LED, that shows our battery life and also the connection. Um, on the back of the controller, we have all sorts of, of different buttons. We have uh, a button to take a picture. We can control where our camera looks by moving it up and down. Uh, that's the gimbal tilt wheel. We have USB ports, micro USB ports. Uh, we can start a video recording, and then we can change our flight mode. Uh, and that can be anything from sport to GPS mode. And then on the bottom, we have two buttons, and those are kind of like uh, customizable quick buttons, quick link buttons that we can use to access certain features uh, within the drone flight app and make edits while we're in the air. All right, so we've completed our physical state of the drone inspection. We also have all of our documentation and we've checked our flying conditions. The last thing that we want to do uh, or first, doesn't matter, again, this doesn't have to be in, in chronological order here from left to right, but the last thing on our to-do list is to check the drone firmware. So when it comes to updating our firmware, I cannot emphasize enough how important this is because I have personally gone out into the field to perform a flight and my firmware needed to be updated. And that might not seem like a big deal, but if you're only out there with two batteries, sometimes this takes the whole battery just to do an update. And if you go out and let's say you drove four hours to get to a site to, to fly your drone and you lose one whole battery to flying, that's huge. So before you go out and leave your home or say you're traveling and you're at a hotel, always make sure that your firmware is updated before you go out to fly. All right, so we've completed our whole pre-flight checklist. We've, we've checked our flying conditions, the weather. We've, uh, we've looked at our required documentation of where we're planning to perform this operation. We've checked our physical state of the equipment we're using, and we've updated our firmware. So what's next? It's time to fly. It's time to get the drone up in the air and complete our mission. 
Just real quick, here's a few references that I use throughout this presentation. Number two is that YouTube video that goes through the mechanics of flight. Again, if you didn't watch that during the presentation, I strongly encourage you to go back and check that out. Um, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to Justin or myself. We're always going to be here to help you along the way. And uh, I'll see you in lesson two.